I am her unforgettable first love, yet, in front of me, she accepted another man's proposal, while I lay dead in a dark, damp rental room, she wore her wedding dress and walked arm in arm with Robert into the church, on the honeymoon flight, she calmly turned off the news of my death, but back in her apartment, she cried bitterly, Jack, come back, Miriam, we can't go back, chapter 1, after Miriam and I got together, we became a legend at school, after all, the story of a wealthy girl falling in love with a poor boy made everyone envious, on her 25th birthday, I planned to propose, I should have been the main character of that proposal, but I became an observer instead, because the man Miriam always wanted to marry was her fiancé, every year we were together, Miriam celebrated her birthday twice, once, to fulfill social obligations with high society, and once, for just the two of us, as I was decorating the proposal venue in my rental room, Miriam, dressed in an elegant gown, walked into a private five-star hotel, five hours later, the venue was finally ready, sitting on the floor, I imagined how Miriam would look when she said yes to my proposal, a smile spread across my face, ding, the sound of my phone interrupted my daydream, someone from the company attending a banquet had an emergency, and I was called in as a replacement, I put on the suit I had prepared for the proposal and drove to the hotel hosting the banquet, Jack, you made it, Sandra greeted me with a bear hug, Sandra was a senior colleague I met during my internship, highly capable, she was known as the prodigy at the company, perhaps because we shared similar backgrounds, Sandra and I had grown close, after some small talk, Sandra began assigning tasks for the evening, the main focus was to promote the company's services and build relationships with clients, thinking about my proposal later that night, I planned to finish my tasks quickly, walking into the banquet hall, I marveled at the luxury of the event, I grabbed a glass of champagne and headed straight for the target clients, conversations flowed, toasts were made, and I gradually engaged with each client, a sharp pain in my stomach made me break out in a light sweat, but I still picked up a glass of white wine, ready to wrap up the night, suddenly, the lights in the banquet hall dimmed, a spotlight illuminated the stairs on the second floor, accompanied by the soft notes of a piano, Miriam appeared in the spotlight, it was Miriam's birthday party, for a moment, I thought she was walking toward me, at that moment, it felt like the entire hall contained just the two of us, under the dim light, with her stunning dress, delicate makeup, and sweet smile, she looked perfect, in that instant, I instinctively reached for the ring in my suit pocket, the hard touch of the ring snapped me back to reality, a man holding a large bouquet of roses appeared in the center of the hall, seeing him, Miriam's smile grew brighter, and she quickened her pace down the stairs, the man pulled out a ring and knelt on one knee, Miriam, marry me, cheers and applause erupted around me, I stood there, stunned, watching everything unfold, my thoughts racing, Miriam covered her mouth in surprise, tears of joy welling up in her eyes, this was the moment I had dreamed of countless times, now it was happening right in front of me, but the man across from her wasn't me, I will. Miriam's familiar, clear voice pierced through my heart, just like that summer smile years ago, it struck me deeply, I set down my glass and fled, but just as I was leaving, someone called out to stop me, chapter 2, Jack, aren't you staying to wish us well? Miriam's melodious voice echoed through the banquet hall, stopping me in my tracks, I had no choice but to turn around awkwardly, the guests' cheers gradually subsided, and their gazes began to scrutinize me from head to toe, wearing her signature smile, Miriam took Robert's hand and slowly walked toward me, I clenched my fists tightly, my heart in turmoil, Jack, my college classmate, Miriam introduced gracefully, Robert, my fiancé, I had never attended any of Miriam's birthday parties, therefore, I had never seen this side of her, polite, poised, yet distant and aloof, I looked at the familiar yet unfamiliar Miriam, filled with a mix of emotions, I didn't know what expression I wore at that moment, but I knew Miriam wanted her day to end perfectly, suppressing the pain in my lower abdomen, I extended my right hand and nodded politely, Mr. Wong, I've heard so much about you, in response to my friendly gesture, Robert did nothing but sneer, my outstretched hand hung awkwardly in the air, and I felt a bit humiliated, so, you're Jack, thanks for taking care of Miriam all these years, his tone was full of the victor's contempt, at that moment, I knew Robert fully understood my relationship with Miriam, I turned my gaze to Miriam, but she stood beside him, looking petite and delicate, completely indifferent to my silent plea for help, I withdrew my gaze, then I'll leave her in your care, Mr. Wong, I'll naturally take better care of her than you, a country bumpkin, Robert said, patting my shoulder, by the way, you're pretty temperamental, do you know how you got your job, the whispers of the guests echoed around us, I frowned in embarrassment, my mind racing, during my senior year, I saw the company's job listing, it was a fortune 500 company, and the competition was fierce, I passed every hurdle and finally got the position, 
Getting into this company on my own and staying in this city was my greatest pride. I had gone through every step of the process, and there had been no help from Miriam. Seeing my confusion, Robert scoffed. Miriam arranged it for you. Otherwise, do you really think you could have beaten out those who studied overseas? Naive. Miriam, who had been silent for a long time, finally spoke. But it wasn't to defend me, it was to mock me. Stop crushing his spirit for people with humble origins. All they have left is their pitiful pride. Chapter 3. All they have left is their pitiful pride. That sentence kept echoing in my ears, in my memory. Someone else had said the same words. Back then, Miriam had defended me. On the first day of school, I became the special case in the dormitory. They had the latest Apple gadgets. I had only an old phone. They compared their limited edition sneakers. While my entire outfit was worth just 35 yuan, there were four of us in the dormitory. It was clear that, except for me, the other three came from wealthy families. In the second month of freshman year, my roommate Alex lost a thousand yuan. Naturally, his first suspect was me. Or rather, he was certain that I was the thief, but he had no intention of pursuing the matter. Maybe he thought a thousand yuan was nothing to him, but I endured his sarcastic remarks for a whole month. Coming from a poor background, I couldn't afford to get into conflicts with others because I couldn't bear the consequences, so I endured. But everyone has their limits. During a campus event, a girl fell in front of me, and I helped her up. Later, the girl's phone went missing. All three of my roommates immediately accused me, claiming I had stolen money in the dormitory before. My denial did nothing but provoke a commotion among the other students. As more and more people gathered, memories of the cold stares and snide remarks flooded my mind. I lost control and got into a fight with Alex. Miriam rushed over when she heard the noise and pulled me and Alex apart, despite her petite frame. At that moment, she was like a general descending from the heavens, shielding me behind her. She took out her phone and started recording, pointing it at Alex. You say he stole your money. Do you have any proof? Of course I do. But seeing the recording, Alex grew nervous and stammered. Uh, well, because he's the only one in the dorm who's broke, then you have no evidence. What you're doing now is slander. Do you understand? I was just trying to protect his pitiful pride. For someone as poor as him, all he has left is his pitiful pride. Miriam pressed down on my agitation and her voice rang out across the entire field. What if I say you spent the money yourself, and you're the one who stole the phone? You're claiming to be the victim, but maybe you're just a thief shouting, stop, thief, to distract everyone. Alex vehemently denied it, but the surrounding students began to whisper. He started to grow agitated, but Miriam just sneered. What's the matter? For someone as rich as you, did these words hurt your pitiful pride? Eventually, the girl's phone was found in the hidden compartment of her bag. Miriam led the onlookers and forced Alex to return to the dorm to find the money. She recorded the entire process. Alex found the missing money under his locker and repeatedly apologized. The truth was finally revealed. I don't remember how that day ended, but I remember Miriam shining brightly, and her words, don't be afraid, I've got your back. Chapter 4. Time changes everything. The person who once stood in front of me to protect me is now using the same words to mock me. Just last night, she acted like a child, begging me for a romantic birthday at home. But now, only one day later, she's become someone unrecognizable. I unclenched my fists and casually picked up a glass of wine. Stepping forward, today is your special day. I wish you both a lifetime of happiness. I raised my glass and drank it all in one go. Then, I turned around and left. The moment the door closed, tears fell like rain. I stumbled back to my apartment. Ignoring the pain, I drank all the alcohol in the cabinet. In the small, unlit room, moonlight poured in. Barely illuminating the proposal setup I had arranged all day, I sat quietly on the couch, and at my feet lay the roses I had prepared for the proposal. Compared to the bouquet at the party, mine looked small and insincere. I took out the ring, a three-carat diamond that sparkled in the moonlight. It was still far from the ten-carat engagement ring. I placed the ring on the table. In the quiet room, a cold laugh escaped, it was me, mocking my own naivety. Miriam and I were never equals. She had told me long ago that she was engaged to someone else. Though she always added, it's arranged by my family, but I'm rebellious, I only want to be with you, yet I knew we wouldn't last. This outcome was always inevitable. After all, no one believes in a rich girl falling in love with a poor boy, not even me. She was a golden girl, and I was dirt from the countryside, completely unrelated. But humans are greedy. I mustered the courage to take one step forward, only to be slapped hard by reality. So, I retreated, hiding in this small house. The pain in my stomach intensified until I passed out. I dreamed I was back in that summer filled with cicadas. I was covered in dirt. In the 30 degree heat, sweat soaked through my clothes. A girl in a light yellow dress appeared in the sunlight. Jack. Jack. I looked in the direction of her voice. The smile under the umbrella was dazzling. Piercing through my entire summer. 
Jack, I saved you, so you have to repay me. Jack, you're amazing, you're just like me. Jack, stay by my side forever. Jack, when the first rays of morning light passed through the window, I was lying on the cold floor. I looked at my silent phone. Miriam hadn't returned all night. Chapter 5. I got up and poured myself a cup of coffee. The bitterness on my tongue spread to my chest. This coffee was unusually bitter. After finishing the coffee, I took out my suitcase, preparing to leave. After graduation, I rented this place with my salary. There were too many memories of Miriam and me here. But now, staying would only make things worse. Just as my suitcase hit the floor, Miriam opened the door. Are you going on a trip? She had changed out of yesterday's dress and into casual clothes. Her clear, innocent eyes made it seem like someone else had been proposed to last night. I had so many questions to ask her, but now I didn't want to say a word. I silently pulled the suitcase and turned to leave. Miriam grabbed my arm. Why aren't you talking? Where are you going? I shook off her hand. I'm leaving this place, leaving you. She froze for a moment, as if she understood, then turned and closed the door. I think we need to talk. She pulled my suitcase and sat down. I've never wronged you. So are you just going to leave without saying a word? You accepted the proposal. If I don't leave, should I stay for your wedding? Miriam looked around and then burst out laughing. As if she had heard the funniest joke, she reverted to the cold, indifferent version of herself from last night. We were never going to get married. You should have known that. You wouldn't have achieved your success without my help. Now, at this moment, it's best if you just behave yourself. That sentence shattered all my pretense. From the first day I met Miriam, I knew I wasn't worthy of a girl like her. But she became my girlfriend anyway. From the first day we were together, I knew we wouldn't get married. But her constant promises made me think we could take another step forward. Now it was clear, it was all just a dream of my own. It's time to wake up. I grabbed my suitcase. I've quit my job. And I'm leaving you too. A flicker of surprise crossed Miriam's eyes. She probably didn't expect the obedient Jack to be so resolute now. She held onto my arm. Her eyes filling with tears. Jack. Robert and I are just a business arrangement. Stay. Don't leave me. Tears fell down Miriam's face, making her look pitiful. I sighed and picked up the engagement ring from the table, opening the box. This is the engagement ring I prepared. If you agree to marry me, I'll stay. Her sobs stopped instantly, but she still didn't answer. It was just a casual test, the answer was obvious. I sneered. What's wrong? Don't want to. Without waiting for her reply, I put the ring down. If you're not willing to marry me, then as for staying by your side, I'm not willing either. I raised my voice. Miriam. We're even. She shook her head repeatedly, then collapsed on the couch. After the heavy door closed, the room fell silent. Only the bug on Miriam's waist was still flashing. Chapter 6 A month later, in the dark, damp rental room, I lay quietly on the bed. Today is Miriam's wedding day. Looking at the sunlight streaming through the window, I imagined how beautiful Miriam must look in her wedding dress. On the simple table lay a medical report and some sleeping pills. Years of hard work had only brought me the words pancreatic cancer. Sunlight poured into the church as Miriam, dressed in a luxurious wedding gown, walked arm in arm with Robert toward the pastor. Miriam should finally be getting what she always wanted. Meanwhile, I drifted off into a deep sleep. On her honeymoon flight, Miriam received the news of my death. Her eyelashes trembled, and her fingers gripping the phone turned pale. Noticing her strange behavior, Robert looked up and asked, What's wrong? Miriam calmly closed her phone and smiled. Nothing. Just spam. In that brief moment. A glimmer of coldness flashed in her eyes. I knew that Miriam regretted it. But by now, I didn't care anymore. If you don't treat someone well when they're alive, no amount of affection after their death means anything. Sandra handled my funeral. We had a close friendship. She spared no expense. Choosing an excellent burial site. Perhaps it was heaven's mercy. But on the day I was laid to rest, it rained. In the distance, I saw a vague silhouette that looked a lot like Miriam. But Miriam should have been on her honeymoon. How could she be here? Chapter 7 after I died, Miriam lived two lives. By day, she was the head of the company, decisive and fierce. At night, she became the gentle and virtuous daughter-in-law of the Wang family. The elders of the Wang family didn't like her strong, businesswoman persona. So on weekends, Miriam would return to the apartment to handle work. It was only in that apartment, which had once been ours, that she could be her true self again. Hours later, Miriam closed her laptop. She stretched lazily, finally done. The excitement in her voice was obvious. She must have completed an important project. After her stretch, she shouted as usual, Jack, pour me a good drink so I can celebrate. But before she could finish her sentence, her tone gradually lowered. In the past, I would have replied from the living room, sure thing, coming right up. Then, like a waiter, I'd hand her a glass, and she'd burst into laughter every time. But now, the apartment was silent. She glanced at the quiet living room, 
realizing that I was no longer there. Quickly, she snapped back to reality. Miriam walked to the liquor cabinet and poured herself a glass of whiskey. With the glass in hand, she stepped onto the balcony, gazing at the wilting begonias. Those begonias were her favorite flowers, but once she brought them home, I had taken on the responsibility of caring for them. That, of course, had led to a debate. Aren't I your girlfriend? Yes. Shouldn't you take care of your girlfriend? Yes. Aren't begonias my favorite flower? Yes. Then shouldn't you help take care of them too? Yes. Realizing I had been tricked, I shook my head, but the camera had already captured the moment. We both laughed, and watering the begonias became part of my daily routine. Looking back at those sweet memories now, I can no longer tell if Miriam was truly happy or just pretending. Staring at the withered begonias, Miriam blurted out, Jack, what's wrong with you? The begonias have withered. After speaking, she turned toward the living room and froze. She watered the flowers herself and then, humming a tune, headed to the kitchen. It seemed as though my death hadn't affected her at all. In the kitchen, vegetables she had prepared were already waiting. She set down her drink and expertly heated the pan. As usual, Miriam began ordering me around, Jack, bring the vegetables over. But the only sounds in the empty kitchen were Miriam's voice and the sizzling of hot oil. She hesitated, then calmly sprinkled the chopped scallions into the pan, only to be scalded by a splash of oil. Jack. In pain, she instinctively called my name, but the room remained silent, realizing I would never rush out to tend to her as I always had. Miriam turned off the stove and walked out of the kitchen, enduring the pain. Chapter 8. In the cramped apartment, Miriam sat motionless on the sofa. It had been more than a month, yet everything remained as it was when I left. The setup for my proposal was still untouched. Rose petals forming a path, silver balloons covering the walls. Even the diamond ring remained in its original spot. The apartment gradually grew darker. Miriam sat there like a statue, unmoving. Her expression was calm, devoid of sadness. And why would she be? A woman who abandoned me so heartlessly couldn't possibly grieve for me. Perhaps she was just filled with regret. Regret for calling out to me during the proposal. Regret for not continuing to play her role in front of me. Regret, most of all, for losing someone as obedient as I was, a backup she could always count on. My departure was like the dampness after a rainstorm. And Miriam walked through it, trudging through the mud. She sat like that for who knows how long until the moonlight seeped into the living room. Miriam stirred. She got up and opened a drawer, pulling out a camera. Pictures and videos of our daily life flashed before her, frame by frame. Miriam silently covered her face, tears of regret squeezing through her fingers. Snap. The dim room lit up as Robert appeared in the doorway of the apartment. Miriam's face was filled with shock. What are you doing here? He didn't answer, instead stepping forward to snatch the camera from her hands. The sweet sounds from the camera irritated him. Frowning, he harshly questioned. Is this what you call business? Miriam, forgetting to wipe the tears from her face, stood up to try and grab the camera back. But Robert shoved her to the ground. Give me the camera back. She got up and tried to grab it again, but her small frame was no match for Robert, and she was once again pushed to the ground. Robert's eyes fell on the diamond ring on the table, opening the box. He looked at the ring I had prepared and burst into laughter. Is this all the sincerity it takes for you to be heartbroken for this long? He threw the camera to the floor, blocking Miriam as she tried to save it. Come on, Miriam. It's been a month. You've played this dramatic love scene long enough. Seeing the hatred and despair in Miriam's eyes, he suddenly embraced her tightly and professed his love. Miriam, I love you. No matter what you feel for Jack, you're Mrs. Wong now, my wife. Miriam pushed Robert away and slapped him across the face. Get out. You don't deserve to say his name. Chapter 9. As my words fell, Robert froze for a moment, then slammed the door and left. Miriam seemed unfazed by the warning she had just received. With Robert gone, she rushed frantically to the camera, checking it carefully. But no matter how many times she tried to turn it on, the screen remained dark, just like me now, lifeless. Overwhelmed by everything, Miriam couldn't hold back anymore and burst into tears. It's my fault. I was wrong. I shouldn't have treated you like that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Jack, I don't want anything anymore. Come back. Please. Just come back. Miriam, the only daughter of the Lee Family Corporation, had always been capable and self-sufficient. No matter what happened, she was rational and composed. I had never seen her so out of control. But no matter how loudly she begged, the room remained silent. In the past, as soon as her eyes filled with tears, no matter how unreasonable her requests were, I would have softened before a single tear fell and agreed to whatever she wanted. But now, despite her sobbing and pleading, I could only see her foolishness born from emptiness and loneliness. Half an hour later, the crying in the apartment stopped. Miriam washed her face and picked up a photo of us, gazing at it carefully. Jack, you'll understand me. She put the frame back down, 
carefully aligning it. Then she turned, packed the camera into her bag, and left the apartment, turning off the lights. She also took the engagement ring from the table. The clean and tidy table was left with only a set of investigation documents. On the first page was a photo of a young Miriam, but the name on it was Lara. Lara, female, from Nan County. Nan County, that was my hometown. My memory drifted back to the day I first met Miriam. It was the first day of university. I was carrying a shabby bag, pushing through the crowd to find the registration desk. A senior greeted me warmly, guiding me through the paperwork. Nan County, you're from Nan County. I put down the pen, and a bright girl stood in front of me. Hi, I'm Miriam. Chapter 10. That was the first time we met. In the days that followed, I often thought back to that day, when Miriam stood radiant in the sunlight. She was like a beam of light shining into my dark and cramped life, but when I finally stepped out of the shadows, she was already gone. In the past, as long as she was by my side, her praises would echo in my ears, Jack, you're amazing, you're just like me. At the time, I thought Miriam was merely flattering herself, looking back now, maybe I really was another version of her. I realized I needed to understand this information. Sitting in the taxi, I looked at the familiar scenery and felt a sense of relief. Most people in this world, when faced with despair, believe that death is their only way out. I was no different. I really did swallow an entire bottle of sleeping pills and lay there in that dark, damp rental room, waiting for death. Scenes from my life flashed before my eyes. A life of hardship, ridicule, and the slow, arduous climb to success. I tried my best to play the role of an ordinary person living a difficult life, but even the longest night has an end. My mother's comforting words, Miriam's smile, the mutual encouragement between us, these gradually overshadowed the darkness. In that moment, I became terrified of the death that was approaching. Yet the sleeping pills had already taken effect. My consciousness faded, leaving me helpless to save myself. Tears welled in my eyes, and I desperately wished someone would find me before it was too late. But in that cheap rental, everyone was too busy with their own struggles to care about a stranger's life. In the last moments of my consciousness, someone kicked the door open and rushed in. When I woke again, I was already in the hospital. Sandra was sitting by my bed, busy working on her laptop. Hearing me stir, she turned around, and her expression shifted from surprise to joy. You're awake, are you thirsty? I'll get you some water. I nodded, watching her quietly. The doctor said after your stomach was pumped, you can only drink warm water. I'll mix some for you. Let me know if you feel like eating later. Though the doctor said you can only have liquid food. She fussed around, talking non-stop. A wave of warmth spread through my chest, filling me with a sense of comfort. How did you end up in that shared rental apartment? Sandra, hearing my question, didn't stop mixing the water. Don't you remember? I helped you find that place. Back then, I hadn't graduated yet and was interning under Sandra. The school was far from the company, so I wanted to find a cheap rental. Sandra recommended that place to me. The living conditions were terrible, but it was close to both the company and the metro. And most importantly, it was cheap. Later, after saving some money, I moved out and rented an apartment. Watching the sunlight stream into the hospital room, I smiled softly. Chapter 11. No one cherishes life more than someone who has died once. Staring at the pancreatic cancer diagnosis for a long time, I calmly shared my thoughts with Sandra. I want to continue the treatment. Sandra looked into my eyes, her tone both comforting and resolute. Good. In the days that followed, Sandra took me to various hospitals for further tests, and the results were beyond my wildest dreams. I only had common gastritis not the so-called late-stage pancreatic cancer. Looking at the gastritis diagnosis papers, I realized that the pancreatic cancer diagnosis was fake. The stamp was fake. The disease was fake. Even the doctor's name couldn't be traced. Under the pressure Sandra and I exerted, the doctor who gave me the cancer diagnosis revealed the truth. It was Miriam who asked me to do it. She's an investor in this hospital, and I couldn't refuse. Hearing Miriam's name, I felt as if I had fallen into an ice pit. She really wanted me dead. After leaving the hospital, Sandra and I sat quietly across from each other. After a long silence, Sandra asked, What are you going to do? I licked my dry lips. Let's give Miriam what she wants. I asked Sandra to send news of my death to Miriam and staged a mock funeral, to make it convincing. I even had Sandra deliver a condolence payment to my mother in the countryside. I stayed in a house Sandra rented for me, focusing on my treatment. The apartment should have been vacated long ago, but Miriam continued to pay the rent for me. Through the surveillance cameras, I watched Miriam in the apartment. From working to spacing out to crying her heart out, it gave me a sense of satisfaction. But when I saw those documents, I was suddenly overwhelmed by an urge to check them. The thought was inexplicable but incredibly strong. Standing outside the apartment, I took out the key I had planned to discard. Click. Miriam hadn't changed the lock. I opened the door, cut the power, 
and locked the door behind me. After taking photos of the document's current state, I picked them up and began to flip through them. Inside were records of Miriam's life over the past 10 years, from a little girl in a rural village of Nan County to the dramatic life of the daughter of the Lee family. Back then, Miriam was still Lara. Chapter 12 As a bone marrow match for the Lee family's daughter, Diana, her parents received a large sum of money and sent her to the Lee family. But fate is unpredictable. The night before the bone marrow transplant surgery, Diana's condition suddenly worsened, and she died despite emergency rescue efforts. That same night, a fire took the lives of all of Lara's relatives in the countryside. In the end, Lara naturally became the daughter of the Lee family. She was sent abroad for education at a young age, and only after growing up was she brought back to China and renamed Miriam. Nan County, a little girl, a great fire. It reminded me of a girl I had met briefly in my childhood. In the rural areas, education wasn't valued, and there were always those who didn't go to school, waiting at the school gates to bully weaker children. I heard the cries of a girl from an empty alley. I paused for a moment, then grabbed my backpack and walked past, but the unease in my heart made me turn into the alley. A frail little girl was being pinned to the ground by three people, cigarette butts scattered nearby. Her arms were covered in burn marks. Fortunately, those kids were bullies who preyed on the weak. After a brief scuffle, they ran off, humiliated though I got a bit roughed up. It was just minor injuries. I helped the frail girl up, took her to the clinic for medicine, and escorted her home. Before I left, she tugged at my shirt, timidly asking, will they come back to get me? I held her hand. Don't worry, I've got your back. Not long after, the girl started waiting for me at that alley entrance. Can you tell me your name? She asked. I was a bit puzzled but still told her. Jack. She nodded and turned to leave. Then she paused, looked back, and said, I'll remember you before running off. The next time I passed by her house, it had already been reduced to ruins. Eventually, I left the mountains, and the memory of that girl gradually faded. Could Miriam be that frail girl? The doctor once said she had old scars and burns on her arms, which would surely leave marks, but Miriam's skin is smooth and fair, with no sign of injury. I opened the photos I had just taken of the documents and placed them back where they belonged, preparing to leave, behind me. Miriam's voice echoed, Are you ready to leave? Chapter 13. I hesitated for a moment, but then prepared to rush out the door. Miriam was quicker and blocked the exit. I was wrapped up tightly, with only my eyes visible. Miriam shouldn't be able to recognize me. I kept my head down, intending to force the door open, but somehow, she found the strength to keep me from pushing past her. As we struggled, Miriam couldn't help but speak. Jack, how long are you going to hide? Time stopped at that moment. My hands dropped to my sides. Miriam pulled down my mask and hugged me. I knew it. I knew you weren't dead. Her tears soaked my shoulder. I gently pushed her away and said calmly, Miriam, we're over. No, there's more to it than you know. She stepped forward, trying to grab my hand, but I avoided her. I moved closer to the door, seeing that I still wanted to leave. Miriam made one last attempt to stop me. Do you remember the girl you saved? That was me. Those words had an impact. I didn't open the door to leave. Jack, there's more to the story than you know. After becoming Miriam, the Lee family treated her like their own daughter. She transformed from a weak girl from the countryside into the eldest daughter of the Lee Corporation. After returning to China, she, like me, was accepted into a university. At first, she only wanted to stay by my side to repay me, but eventually, she wanted to be with me, even though I told her we could fight for a future together. But years of luxury and privilege made it impossible for her to give up the wealth and comfort at her fingertips. She wanted to have it all, to keep it hidden from me while marrying Robert, but Robert had already investigated her. The humiliating scene at the proposal was Robert's doing. He arranged for the company staff to be absent from Miriam's birthday party and had someone remind Sandra that I was on leave that day. So, it was no surprise that I showed up at their engagement ceremony. When I was about to turn and leave, Robert dragged Miriam in my direction. Miriam called out to me to protect me and stabilize Robert, mocking me to my face. The next day, Miriam came to see me, only to discover that Robert had planted a listening device on her. She had no choice but to maintain the aggressive act threatening and manipulating me. But after my death, Miriam finally realized the truth. I meant far more to her than wealth and status. With tears streaming down her face, Miriam looked at me. Jack, can we start over? I turned away with a sigh. Miriam, no one waits in the same place forever. It's impossible for us now. Chapter 14 When I stepped out of the apartment, Sandra was standing at the door. She looked like she had been waiting for a long time. How did you know I was here? She just smiled and opened the car door. Just a guess. Get in. I had a vague feeling that Sandra's affection for me had long surpassed the admiration of a senior for a junior. That night, Sandra cooked a huge meal, 
saying it was to celebrate my recovery from my stomach condition. She even opened a bottle of red wine for the occasion. Your stomach is finally better, so now you can eat whatever you want. She raised her glass. Cheers. To escape from Miriam, I had moved into Sandra's house. During my treatment, Sandra had been the one taking care of me. The doctor had ordered a light diet, strictly forbidding anything spicy or heavy. Sandra, being a northern girl, loved spicy food, but to accommodate me, she had been eating plain food all this time. It's your appetite that's finally free. I raised my glass. Sandra, thank you for staying by my side all this time. If it weren't for you, I might have died in that rented room. You're my savior. If you ever need anything, just ask. I'll never say no. Cheers. After downing a glass of wine, Sandra's face flushed slightly. She poured herself another glass. I have something to tell you now. She raised her glass, her eyes sincere and intense. I've spent three years with you. You're a strong yet insecure person, capable but proud. You seem to get along with everyone, but in reality, you don't have anyone close in your heart. You're very aware of your own value, who can be your friend, and who can benefit you. You've weighed it all carefully in your mind. Your relationship with Miriam was the only greedy part of you. But Jack, the partner you need is someone who can stand by your side. No doubt about that. From ability to personality and appearance, I'm the right choice. So, I hope you'll consider me. You don't need to answer me right away. I want a well-thought-out answer. Not a casual brush-off. This toast, I drink to myself. Chapter 15 I watched Sandra down her glass of red wine, and my ears reddened. Her words just now had laid me bare. She had revealed her hand. What would my answer be? Before, she was my superior, experienced, talented, always landing the most profitable projects for the company. I used to see her as nothing more than a senior colleague, but over the past few days, with her careful attention to me and the way she handled things with Miriam, I began to realize that Sandra, despite her role, was just a girl three years older than me. She would shout with excitement when she scored a discount coupon, blush with embarrassment at fictional couple interactions and shed tears at tragic movie scenes. She wasn't wrong. I had always been clear about my identity, status, and what I wanted in a partner. Miriam had been nothing more than a reckless dream of my youth, one that ended as soon as I woke up. Reality was an unbridgeable chasm. Night fell. I lay quietly in bed, a breeze drifting in, softly stirring the curtains. Morning arrived quietly. Despite not sleeping a wink, I felt surprisingly energetic. Sandra looked at me, fully dressed and ready, with a look of astonishment. Where are you going? job hunting. I've already eaten. The food on the table is yours. Don't forget to eat. I grabbed the documents from the table, turned, and walked out the door. The company I previously worked for was well known in the industry, and with my accumulated experience, I quickly found a new job. On my third day at the new company, I was assigned a project, but the client was Lee Enterprises. I hesitated, not wanting any contact with Miriam. Sandra, however, encouraged me to take the project. From a business perspective, Lee Enterprises is a leader in the industry. Completing this project would be hugely beneficial for you. You have to understand that in business, maximizing benefits is the eternal topic. Jack, I believe you can handle your emotions and your work. Sandra's words woke me up. If I wanted to continue growing in this industry, I had to move forward, even if Miriam was on the other side. Through hard work, the project progressed smoothly. When visiting Lee Enterprises to discuss the partnership, I did my best to avoid Miriam, but as the project advanced, we eventually crossed paths. Chapter 16. Long time no see. Jack. Miriam sat at the head of the table, her expression calm and composed, facing the curious stares of everyone around us. I unbuttoned my suit jacket and sat down confidently. M.S. Lee. Long time no see. Although our previous collaboration wasn't pleasant, I'll give my all for this one. I hope M.S. Lee will lend her support. The others nodded knowingly. So, group leader he and M.S. Lee have worked together before. Miriam understood what I meant. Of course, business is business. The meeting went smoothly. During the coffee break, Miriam cornered me in the bathroom. Jack, I didn't expect you to be doing so well after leaving me. I looked down, washing my hands. M.S. Lee, you're too kind. I dried my hands and tried to leave, but she blocked my way at the sink, leaning closer. She whispered, Jack, I don't believe you don't care about me at all. I took two steps back. Whether you believe it or not is your business. Whether I can do my job is mine. Maybe my two steps back hurt Miriam's feelings. Her eyes reddened slightly. If you really don't care, why are you still wearing that tie? Don't tell me you've forgotten that I gave it to you as a birthday present. This tie was Miriam's gift to me for my 20th birthday. At that time, I was looking for an internship, saving up for a long time to buy a suit. Since I didn't know how to tie a tie, my teacher advised, just don't wear one. It's better than messing it up. On my 20th birthday, I received a tie from Miriam. You'll need a tie for your interview if you're going to do it. 
Do it right. Let me tie it for you. She helped me tie it on the day of the interview. Two. As she adjusted it, she reminded me. Don't be nervous during the interview. This tie costs enough to buy a car. The interviewer will just think you're a rich kid pretending to be poor. Just act naturally. Miriam didn't say much more, but I understood what she meant. Maybe a poor person would buy an expensive suit for an interview, but they'd never pair it with an expensive tie. No one from a poor background would spend a fortune on something so seemingly insignificant. I don't know if it was my mindset or the tie that worked, but the interview went smoothly, and I got the internship. I always thought it was my ability that got me the job. It wasn't until I quit that Sandra told me the truth. My ability was good, but there were many equally talented candidates. Some even had projects they could bring to the company. They chose me because of the tie. Not because of its price, but because of the way it was tied. It was only thanks to Miriam that I got the internship at that company. I looked at the stubborn Miriam in front of me. Miriam, I'm really grateful to you for giving me that opportunity. But I wear this tie to commemorate my first success. If it's given you any misunderstandings, I can return it to you. Chapter 17 I untied the tie and placed it in Miriam's hand, leaving her with a quick, wait a moment before going out. I stepped past her and left. Miriam stood frozen in place, but after that, she didn't give me any more trouble. That evening, when I got home, I found the tie on the table again. I picked it up and looked closely, though it was neatly folded in the box. I recognized it as the same one I had worn that morning. Sandra came out of the kitchen and saw me fiddling with the tie. Miriam asked me to give it back to you. She said she's not petty enough to take back something she gave as a gift. I put the tie down and stood up. You met with Miriam? Yeah. She asked me to meet today. Did she give you a hard time? Sandra sighed. No. We just chatted a bit. Now. Come wash your hands for dinner. After dinner. I cleaned up the dishes. Sandra took out the game controllers and started setting up the game. Most guys like video games. And I'm no exception. But Miriam didn't like them. To accommodate her. I deleted all my games and sold my controllers. As a child raised to be an heir. Her entertainment consisted of golf and equestrian activities. She didn't enjoy video games and even hated watching me play them. In her eyes. People who played video games were wasting their lives. If it weren't for the fact that developing video games could be profitable, I doubt Miriam would have ever allowed the Lee Corporation to get involved in the industry. Sandra, on the other hand, was different. She wasn't passionate about gaming, but she accepted my love for it. She even took the initiative to learn various strategies so we could play side by side. As a beginner, her moves often made me laugh, but she didn't mind, happily enjoying the game. After finishing with the dishes, I wiped my hands and walked into the living room. Seeing me, Sandra excitedly called out, come over here, I'll show you a new move I just learned, it'll definitely impress you. I took the controller and teased her, alright, show me what you've got, hero. The peaceful evening outside contrasted with the laughter inside, downstairs, Miriam stood under the streetlight, looking up at the illuminated balcony, her eyes filled with longing, she didn't lower her gaze until the lights in the house went out, kicking a pebble at her feet, tears streamed down her face, she sighed, turned, and walked away. Chapter 18. Miriam never contacted me again. On the day the project ended, I received a message on my phone. I'm divorced. Let's meet. There was no name, just a phone number, but I knew the message was from Miriam. I turned off my phone and continued working. At lunch, a colleague told me that Miriam had divorced. I pretended to be surprised. They chatted endlessly about it, but I just listened. I didn't reply to Miriam's message, but I still saw her in the parking lot. Your manager didn't have any documents for you. I asked him to call you down. As I got into Miriam's car, she said calmly, Jack, I'm divorced, I heard. Reaching this point, I regret it. When I married Robert, deep down, I thought it was because the marriage alliance would strengthen the Lee Corporation. I'm not the Lee family's biological daughter, but they treated me so well, and I felt I had to repay them. But later, I realized it was actually my own choice. People always weigh the pros and cons. Whether it's a man or a woman, we all choose what benefits us the most. But sometimes, What's beneficial isn't necessarily what's right. Jack, I made the wrong choice. Only when I'm with you do I not need to wear a mask. Do I feel like my true self? Don't worry. I'm not here to cling to you. I just wanted closure today. To be more precise, I'm saying goodbye to my past self. After today, I will fully return to being Miriam of the Lee family. Goodbye, Jack. As Miriam's car drove out of the parking lot, I called out after her. Goodbye, Miriam. Chapter 19. Time passed quickly. And soon. A year had gone by. On the last day of the year, I took the day off. When Sandra came home from work, she was greeted by me holding a bouquet of flowers. Her eyes filled with tears like a schoolgirl, but her face was full of joy. As the New Year's bell rang, on the balcony, I wrapped my arm around Sandra's shoulder, watching the brilliant fireworks in the sky. We raised our glasses together. Happy New Year!
Happy New Year. When the fireworks finished, I whispered in Sandra's ear, I'm so lucky to have you by my side. Sandra smiled and looked up at me, I'm lucky you didn't miss me. Chapter 20. Sandra's Perspective. Jack was the new intern at the company, much like I had been when I first started, ambitious, hardworking, yet with a noticeable touch of pride. Maybe it was because of our similar backgrounds and personalities, but I admired him. I had heard that he came with Miriam's recommendation, which gave me a slight bias against him. Those who work their way up naturally despise those who come through connections. But as time passed, I realized that Jack was sincere and had no airs about him. On the day of Miriam's birthday party, Jack had been called in by me at the last minute, but that night, I witnessed one of the most humiliating moments of his life. I couldn't help but feel partially responsible for his embarrassment. Afterward, Jack resigned. I tried to persuade him to stay, but he was firm in his decision. Reluctantly, I approved his resignation, fearing that he might do something to harm himself. I contacted him daily. Then, on the day of Miriam's wedding, he disappeared. I searched for him frantically but found nothing. Finally, I remembered the cheap rental apartment. After running around in circles, I found him unconscious. Looking at the diagnosis for pancreatic cancer, I felt a deep sadness. But luckily, Jack said he was willing to seek treatment. I took him to many hospitals, and the diagnosis eventually changed from pancreatic cancer to gastritis. It felt like a weight had been lifted off my chest. Jack, however, decided to roll with the mistake and asked me to pass the news of his death to Miriam and even helped plan his funeral. To make it convincing, I went to the countryside to visit his mother. During those few days, I learned a lot about Jack's past. He was a sweet boy once. Later, for reasons unknown, he disappeared again. I drove to his old apartment and waited. After a while, Miriam showed up too. At that moment, I was certain Jack was there. When he finally came out alone, I couldn't explain the happiness I felt inside. I knew I liked Jack, but as adults, our feelings remain well hidden. I pretended to remain calm as I opened the car door. That night, fueled by a bit of alcohol, I finally confessed my feelings. I didn't give Jack the chance to respond immediately, but I knew that Jack would choose me, because I was the one he needed. Jack didn't want to take on the project with Lee Enterprises. But this project was crucial for his future development. I knew he simply hadn't figured out how to face Miriam. Learning to weigh the pros and cons is a lesson every adult must understand. So, I encouraged him to take on the project. On the day Jack went to Lee Enterprises for a meeting, Miriam came to find me. We had an open conversation. When she left, she handed me a tie. I think she realized she had no chance anymore. In truth, I didn't care about their past. But during my talk with Miriam, I learned a secret, the pancreatic cancer diagnosis was arranged by Robert. I didn't tell Jack. At this point, their misunderstanding went far beyond a mere medical report. Jack and I spent some time without Miriam in the picture. On New Year's Eve, Jack surprised me with something I hadn't expected. As I predicted, Jack had chosen me, but that didn't make me any less happy. As the New Year's bells rang, Miriam turned and left from outside. I watched Jack, lost in the joy of the moment. I knew that this new year marked the beginning of something new for us.